to reimagination itself. Why the steam? And I believe the key thing about it is that it underpins our response to change as individuals, as organizations, as a country. It really is necessary to prepare us for the tipping point, that line that shoots up, so that we are prepared because otherwise it will leave us back footed. So what are the possible responses to change? I think there are three possibilities. I'm sure you can think of others. But I've tried to break it down in three broad groups to give us a sense of structure. The first are the traditionalists. These are the people who tend to favor the status quo, maybe stay within the comfort zone. And they're contented with and perhaps even a little bit complacent about their current achievements. Because their way of doing things has worked, they probably see or feel less of a pressure to do things differently, or maybe they respond incrementally to change. So their mantra could well be, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's perfectly reasonable to adopt that approach. So I wanted to give you an example, not that Borders is in itself a traditionalist, but I want to give you a sense of how they were trapped in a particular way of doing things. If you think about it, Borders started off as actually a very creative bookstore. They were path-breaking in the way they did several things. One of the things they did was they helped you to search to blog for books that they may not have on their shelves, and then they went out, ordered it, and brought it for you to have. This was considered revolutionary when they started it because most bookshops just say, look, if it's not on my shelf, when my next order comes, you can have it. The other thing that they did is, uh, you know, they introduced these coffee shops in their stores and they allowed people to browse through books in the hope that people would stay, read, buy, and of course, you know, have the total experience. Again, quite a revolutionary thought. But their bricks and mortar model was overtaken by the advent of the internet, and the way the internet was used by a whole range of businesses, including, of course, those in the bookstore business. And so what you ended up with was Borders realizing too late that this was the change, came to the party late, and it has recently filed for bankruptcy. An extreme example, but a vivid one, as to how if we are complacent, if we take things for granted, we may be completely eclipsed. The second group, in terms of response to change, are the people who might call the entrepreneurs. They embrace and capitalize on change. They recognize new opportunities, even welcome it, because they see opportunities in it, and they want to adapt to such things early. They want to be at the cutting edge, and their slogan may well be Cafe Diem, Seize the Day. The example that came to mind, keeping the bookstore came for me, was Jeff Bezos of Amazon, the CEO. He recognized early the potential impact of the internet because he saw that people were spending more time on their computers and their laptops and so on rather than actually in the bookshop or the library. So he harnessed that, he avoided to shoot the physical bookshops, went to the model of, look, order your books, you have a fantastic catalog by the internet and I will then deliver it to you when you order it. So no need for physical bookstores. Then he went a step further. With the evolution of the internet, greater bandwidth availability and so on, he started, he actually was one of the prime movers in the whole e-book phenomenon. And of course the Kindle was Amazon's invention. This sort of entrepreneurial response to change is really what has kept Amazon competitive. I say it's entrepreneurial because we're operating on the edge of possibilities, they're pushing some limits, and they're really rethinking each time, how can I stay ahead of the competition? But it's driven in some ways by a very clear commercial organizational objective. Now before I talk about the third category, I want to ask you another question. Which brand of smartphone do you think is the coolest? I'm almost afraid of the answer you're going to give, but anyway, Samsung, Nokia, Apple, and Blackberry.
there's no element of surprise here um, that you've overwhelmingly chosen Oppo, and I, and I assume you mean the iPhone. But there's an interesting story in this. You know, the iPhone came on, what, five years, six years back? Before that, do you know which was the phone that was considered, or which brand was considered the most connected cutting edge? Nokia. Nokia, you know, they had the camera connecting people. And they were phenomenal. Everybody thought, you know, if you don't have a Nokia phone, there's something wrong with you. You know, all the others were engineers, techie type things, but Nokia was the real connector. Completely eclipsed by the iPhone. Almost from nowhere, they came in and they took over the space. Now, Nokia is trying to recover. And, you know, Samsung, Blackberry, everybody's trying to recover. But the iPhone redefined the way we use handheld devices. And this really leads me into the point that Apple and many others like it, they epitomize the final group, the visionaries. This is probably the most exciting group. They are ahead of the curve, they anticipate the needs and actively shape the trend. And under Steve Jobs' leadership, you know, they have not just, you know, they've set trends, they've defined the way we use technology. They created the iPod, the iPad, the you know, iPhone, long before we thought we needed, needed these things. We didn't even know we needed them. And that's really captured the whole spirit of this group in Steve Jobs' quote, because he was asked, what customer survey did you do before you came out with the product? And he said, it's not for the customer to decide what they want. So he's, he's thinking ahead. He's not just doing a linear projection. He's trying to leapfrog and go ahead. And that's really what separates the good from the great. The ability to not just stay ahead of the curve, but to reshape it, to envision the future and make it happen. I'd like to make two additional points about this response to change so that it's kept in the right context. The first is that these change attributes are not mutually exclusive. And what I mean by that is we can all, at the same time, be traditionalists in some context, very entrepreneurial in others, and quite visionary in others. Uh, you might want to be visionary in the way things are run at home, but you may be a little bit more con conservative when it comes to maybe what happens in school. I don't know. We all have that because our models split depending on the context. So it's not as if we are necessarily boxed into any one mode. And we also evolve over time, and it's a function of attitude. Even Apple, for example, in the 70s, it was trapped in the old model because of their platform and how they protected it. And as a result, they were eclipsed by others. And it was only in the later part of the 80s and 90s that they had a resurgence because they redefined the way they did it. So they reimagined and they pushed it differently. The other point I wanted to make is, is imaginative envisioning is not just about grand ideas that require some flash of inspiration. It's also about attention to detail. So for example, an Apple engineer was tasked to ensure that the speed with which the top cover of the packaging can be removed to reveal the new phone book phone, phone, took just enough time to fill the consumer with anticipation and excitement but not so long as to cause frustration. I, I pity the engineer, I'm not sure what he did, how he went about it. But, but the interesting thing is this. this. This is really a Goldilocks approach to design. You know, not too long, because that would be frustrating. Not too short, because that means you lose the, the anticipation just right, you know. Now, I'm sure some of you have experimented with this, and you know, you can let me know later whether that is your whole truth for you. But the interesting thing is this, it is an attention to detail. So it's not just about grand ideas. Sometimes when we talk about reimagination, we're talking about looking at the specifics, looking at the details, because sometimes in the detail lies a major breakthrough.